Can you guys see the manual here? Yes. Yes, no? Yes, all right, yes. good. Um, I figured we'd start tonight's class just um, looking at some components that we talked about and some things that we talked about that I promised I would show you. So um, I'm going to do my best here to kind of zoom in. Hold on. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah. Okay. So this is the quintessential capacitor. This is what it looked like. All right. Right there. Um, and they come in all different sizes and shapes. One of the questions on the exam is going to be, uh, so this is an electrolytic capacitor. This is a ceramic capacitor. And one of the questions on the exam is going to be, why would you use a ceramic capacitor as opposed to an electrolytic capacitor? And the answer is, these suckers are really cheap. That's the only reason you would use them, okay? That's the reason you would use them. So electrolytic capacitors, uh, ceramic capacitors, these get to be huge. Some of them can be two or three feet tall. They store enormous amounts of energy electrically, and you want to be careful with them when you discharge them. So um, that's what a capacitor looks like. This is what a diode looks like. Okay. I don't know how close I can bring it, but that's what a diode looks like. And they allow electricity to travel, or current to travel in one direction only. Roach Motel, remember that? Okay. And then I took apart a kit. This is actually an HF radio that I built um, out of a kit. And it's a pretty famous kit. Let's see if this focuses better. It's hard to see, but I'll try my best to. Not very sharp. If I make it a little smaller, it's a little sharper. So let's try that. I don't know if that's better or worse. Or let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, that's about as much as I'm going to do. So anyway, and I, and I apologize that it's a little fuzzy, but um, these are capacitors here, right? And anytime you see uh, something with wire around it, that's an inductor. And these happens to be called toroidal inductors. And uh, again, I built this, and my wife actually wound these by hand. And they have a certain amount of turns in there, and they store uh, energy magnetically, right, as we remember. Here's another inductor. You can see it's just a core with wire wrapped around it. Okay. Transistor, more inductors. Anytime you see wires wrapped around something, that's usually an inductor. Here's more inductors. Okay. And this happens to be a kit, and it uses just this electronics. Your computer does the rest of the work, and this transmits on one watt and uh, full HF. Okay, pretty neat kit. Cost me about seventy-two dollars. It's a great kit to to uh, put together. Okay, let's see what else we got here. We got uh, we had talked about a antenna analyzer, and this is what one looks like. There's many different types, but this is an antenna analyzer. Okay, and what you do is let me try to zoom out here a little bit. As soon as I find my mouse. Uh, here's the mess. Okay. So it only has one input, which is the antenna. And you would take your antenna, plug it in here, you turn this on. Okay. And then you would get a graph, and it would show you where your antenna is resonant. I have an antenna here. Let's see if I can pull it out without destroying. So I just hook up my antenna here to this guy. And you can see as soon as I do that, I get a chart. And then what I can do is I can measure, and this is SWR, 
standing wave ratio and impedance. And wherever it is at its lowest, it tells me where the antenna is resident. This, it's hard to read. It's impossible to read for you guys. I have to take my word for it. But right now, this antenna is resonant on 10.360 megahertz. And as I start to move to different frequencies, it shows me where I am. And that's how I can tell if I should lengthen or shorten my antenna or adjust my feed line or something else. Okay? And it measures SWR here and impedance here. Okay? That's what an antenna analyzer. It's a kind of a useful tool. Um, I don't use it as much as I thought I was going to use it because I have an antenna tuner. So I don't even bother with this so much. I just roughly measure out the antenna. Um, using my formula, you know, whatever the meter I want to approach is, times 3.28. And um, I usually work with dipoles. And um, I'll just hang the antenna outside, and then my tuner takes care of the rest, generally. Okay? Depends on what I want to do and how precise I want to get. So that's an antenna tuner. And then lastly, well, let me put this away before I break it. Um, somebody had asked me about a bon, what a bon is, B-A-L-U-N. And this is it. OK. And what it is, it's a transformer. It changes an unbalanced line to a balanced line. OK, so it makes everything work kind of a little bit better together. And this has a connector for my antenna down here. And then up here, this is perfectly suited for a dipole. OK, and I just put in a piece of wire here, piece of wire here, screw it down, and off you go. OK, this happens to be a one-to-one -one lawn. Uh, they make them in all different, they make them four to one, five to one, six to one, depending on how unbalanced your system is, is going to be. And you'll learn a little bit more about that in a general class. Okay, but I just wanted you to know that they exist. Do I use these a lot? Not really. The quality of them is not so great for ham radio. And do I notice a difference? Not really, to be honest with you. I'm much more concerned about SWR than I am about um, matching this generally. In some applications with certain antennas, you definitely need one of these. Okay. There are um, magnetic loop antennas where these are important. But for our purposes for this class, I just want you to know that they exist. And so the unbalanced connector is here, and balanced is up here. So they just kind of balance things out in the system. Okay, So that your radio is working on a balanced network with your antenna. So that's what I wanted to show you. OK, I don't think I have anything else at the moment. All righty. Um, I want to talk about um, some questions I had. Some people sent me. Let me get to the questions. And let's see if I can answer them. Uh, let's see. All right, question. Um, so the question is, um, what hardware do I need at the antenna end to match my RG58? I have video bonds, so they make them for video, what we just saw, for security cameras. Will that work? Not really, and the reason is because video bonds, anything video is 75 ohm, um, ham radio is 50 ohm. I think we discussed it last time. And another question I had was, um, my question is, how do you know the difference between sparrow emissions versus uh, overload? Well, overload um, sounds very distorted. Spurious signals can sound as distortion. It can sound, we're going to discuss that in chapter 8. Um, it can sound like uh, out of phase. So it sounds completely different. After the first day or two, you'll know that, be able to tell the difference. No problem. And then I had a question that um, somebody bought an antenna, um, a tram antenna off of Amazon and they're not very happy with performance, what antennas do I like? Well, I like them all. Tram is not bad, OK? Um, the best one, I think, on the market, and this is my opinion, OK, 
is uh, diamond antennas, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. Um, so diamond makes an excellent antenna. But TRAM isn't bad for magnetic mounted antennas. They're not bad. I own one. Um, so if you're not happy with the performance, my suggestion is that you buy an inexpensive SWR meter on Amazon and check the SWR. All of those magnetic mount antennas have an adjustment. There's a little Allen key setting where you can shorten or lengthen um, the length of the antenna. And you only need minute changes, very, very small changes, and that change changes the SWR. So SWR is by far one of the most important things that you can uh, change to improve your system. Okay. Any questions? You guys have any questions at all that I didn't answer so far? No, we're good. All right. Um, I sent you guys a copy of this um, radiogram, and it's one of the types that we use when we want to relay information. If you're interested, and you really should know at least where the, they're called NTS, uh, National Traffic System, um, how it works, just Google NTS in your location, wherever you happen to be, and you can tune in, usually on 2 meter or 440 or 70 centimeter, um, and just listen in on the net, and you'll get the hang of how they uh, forward messages. We practice, like everything else in life, uh, you get good at it by practicing, and we send practice messages back and forth, um, so that, heaven forbid, we really need it in case of an emergency, um, we know how to send messages. This is very, very important because uh, when the chips are down and there's no phones in your area and cell phones don't work, um, this is a great way to help out your neighbor and yourself and your family and your community by being able to pass messages um, any place that they need to go. Okay, cool. So this goes into the radiogram. This is not necessarily on the exam, uh, but I did want you to know what it was about so you can read uh, about this and how to fill it out. Um, it's important as ham radio operators, okay? And finding nets, all you gotta do is just go on Google uh, or the ARRL and they tell you where the traffic nets are. They're called NTS, National Traffic System. Um, good, uh, good deal, okay? Wayne, I got your message. Your mic isn't working. Uh, Gloria's got laryngitis still. I hope you feel better. All right, hold on. That's my reminder to start the class. All right, um, public service. As I told you, Aries, Racy's, um, those are two of the most popular, Aries being one of them. Uh, for example, this Sunday, and uh, this is National Breast Cancer Month, and this Sunday here in New York, there's a gigantic breast cancer walk at Jones Beach. We're expecting around 70,000 people the police and the fire and, and those guys, those uh, first responders need help. Um, we'll have a bunch of, a lot of ham radio operators all throughout the boardwalk. Um, it's about a two and a half mile, if I remember correctly, um, walk. And in case somebody's not feeling well or they need assistance, we have a ham radio operator um, every couple of hundred yards. So we see a problem. We'll call it in to our net control. They'll um, assign it to the appropriate first responder to address the issue. And we use tactical call signs, okay? Instead of our own call signs, we can use tactical signs. We'll say Echo 1 or uh, Delta 2 or whatever is assigned to us for that special event. We also do the marathon, so the Boston Marathon, New York City Marathon, so everything here in the Northeast, every marathon, any place there's a lot of people gathering, um, usually there are ham radio guys assisting first responders. Okay, and that's part of what we do is public service. All right, Aries and Racy's, Aries Amateur Radio Emergency Services, Racy's Radio Amateur um, Civil Emergency Service, and again, these have been around a long, long time, and are. Um, 
Our job is to assist governmental agencies, first responders, Red Cross, Salvation Army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Our particular area group is very closely associated to the American Red Cross, and um, we're very structured. As a matter of fact, my wife happens to be one of the emergency co coordinators for our area on Long Island, and uh, very rewarding to do. Okay. And of course, we're there uh, for any emergencies, disaster, and disaster relief. That's what we do, and we're happy to serve. All right, cool. So what constitutes an emergency? An emergency is anything that threatens life or property. Okay? So that's how we define an emergency. Um, and again, use common sense about this. And the reason that this comes up here is because it tells you this defines by the FCC when we can transmit and where we can't transmit. Um, and we're going to get into those regulations. Um, but the important part here is whatever you need to do to communicate on any frequency during an emergency, that's okay. Not that you won't be called in on the carpet. You will. But it's, it's a viable excuse. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> the waiver of normal rules lasts throughout the uh, imminent danger to life or property. All right? The stress calls. Everybody's familiar with them. Mayday, 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 SOS on ham radio. It's kind of unofficial, but it works just fine. You say break, and the world stops spinning. Okay? Everybody's going to stop to listen to what you have to say. So it's not like CB, breaker, breaker. Please don't do that on amateur radio. I promise you that you'll get a lot of attention if you say that, that there. Okay? All right. Um, and then they go over the protocol and what you need to do. Again, not too, not too much of this is on the exam, so I'm going to just move past it to discuss what's on the exam. Um, all right, so there's a lot of training you can do. FEMA, <clears throat> um, RACES, ARIES, they all offer additional training. Uh, it's all free on how to prepare. Okay, And part of being an amateur radio operator is having a thing called a go kit. Okay, So a go kit is you have your handy talkie, your batteries, your flashlight, whatever you need for emergency medication, and you store it in a separate place in a little bag. Okay, And heaven forbid you need it, you have everything there. Okay, Handy talkies are so efficient what I do is I have a little portable solar charger. And that little solar charger um, gives me enough power to power my handy talkies, my HTs, uh, should I need them. So I don't have to rely on generators or electricity or anything else. And I think I picked up my charger for about 20 bucks on Amazon. It's a little tiny solar charger. It's got a USB connector on the side. And it's enough to charge my my uh, Baofeng radios, no problem. Okay, so you should be prepared. Always have a go kit. Make sure that the batteries are charged and working. That's all part of it. Okay. All right, cool. The biggest rule in uh, amateur radio is that you cannot use the radio to make any money. They call it pecuniary interest. Okay, so you cannot use the radio for business and not use the radio for business all right, to make money. The only exception to that is teachers. Teachers can use amateur radio in the course of their employment when they're teaching a class. All right? So no money. So if you're a salesperson, you can't use it for that. It's really for personal use. The reason that we do that is <clears throat> to keep all the massive amounts of frequencies that we have and not pollute the airways with uh, with commercials and that kind of stuff. So we're com truly 100% commercial free, and um, we want to keep it that way. Okay. All right. Special activities. There are contests. You can look them up on the ARRL website, and that's when all the amateur radio operators get together. They start transmitting. 
and listening, and they want to talk to as many people as humanly possible in the shortest amount of time. I am not a contester. I don't believe that spending two seconds with somebody on the on the radio constitutes a contact. Okay, but some people love to do that, and the idea is to collect as many QSL cards, uh, QSL cards uh, as possible, and um, the further the better. And again, there's a million different contests you can you can participate in. Two meter, seventy centimeter, twenty meter. There are a million of them all over the place. Okay, some of them are for long distance. Some of them are just to talk to all the states. So there's an award for WAS, Working All States, which you've spoken to at least one person in all of the United States, so forth and so on. And you're given these points. This one I do like, okay? And this one is uh, QRP. It's a QRP award. And a thousand mile per watt. Okay? I have beat that. And it's just what I like to do. I like to talk to as many people as I can with the lowest amount of power. Okay? So as I told you at the beginning, uh, my claim to fame thus far is I've spoken to Greece on one watt. Okay? And I actually did phone uh, to Greece on five watts. That's quite an achievement for me. And so that's a personal goal for me. And they always hand out these awards and that kind of stuff. How do they know that you did this? by the logbook, right? We talked about the logbook the last time. I'll enter in the call. The other person, I'll send that to them. Um, they'll validate that we did speak, and then I get to print out this great document. Anyway, um, the field day. Field day is the most popular. The fourth full weekend of June, every ham radio operator that's active will get on, and the idea is you can't use regular power. You can't use power from the wall. You have to use emergency power. So whether that's a generator, solar, um, biochemical, what, whatever you need to do to power your radio to make sure we can all talk to each other. And um, that's uh, certainly US-wide. And I have been in field days where we talk to Europe and Canada and Mexico and South America, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of fun. It, you you, uh, you work for 24 hours straight through. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's somebody transmitting. It's a ton of fun, and I suggest you at least look at that. Okay. Satellites, we talked about that. Um, and there's a bunch of different satellites that you can play with. And you, the International Space Station is one of them. You can listen for them. You can actually try talking to them. And you get a certificate if you do make a contact to the International Space Station. Hi, Joe. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, uh, this is Prabhu. So just like you have mentioned satellites here, can you make radio communication with uh, either commercial uh, or military airplanes, or is that not allowed? It's only allowed. It's only allowed one day of the year. So you can't um, you can't make contact with anything military, and they scramble anyway. So it would you wouldn't be able to decipher it. So the answer is no. You can only talk to other hams. There is one one exception, and we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Okay. So uh, space station um, and satellites. They talk about these terms. Okay. The one that I need you to know. Okay, is whenever you see this word, Keplerian element, okay, it means you're talking to a satellite, okay? And LEO, low Earth orbit, those are the ones I want you to know. So if you ever see the term uh, Keplerian element, anything Keplerian, you will um, know that it's a, either the space station or a satellite. When you get past your um, license, uh, the ARRL will send you on a regular basis uh, data on satellites, and it will start off as Keplerian data or Keplerian elements. And that means it's, they're discussing um, satellite, how easy it is to talk to satellite. The beautiful thing is you can bounce your signal off of a satellite, like a commercial station, okay, and talk to the other side of the world. 
that's certainly possible. All right, and this is one of the most popular. Um, and this is solely designed for amateur use, Oscar. Uh, but there are many. China just uh, launched three um, amateur only, or amateur equipped, I shouldn't say amateur only, but amateur equipped satellites for amateur radio operators to use. All right. And then it talks about working the International yeah, Space Station. You can see uh, YouTube's videos and how to do that. You can build a very inexpensive antenna. I don't think it costs $10. Uh, you make it out of PVC pipe, and you make it out of uh, measuring tape. You know, the metal measuring tapes, you buy a cheap one. You can make a Yagi, a cheap Yagi, and that's all you need, and you're handy talking. And if you're very lucky, um, you can talk to the International Space Station. Okay? All right, cool. Other types of ham radio are video, slow scan television. We can actually send TV transmission Joe? Uh, over. Yes. Sorry, uh, another question. Uh, we have been talking about communicating to objects above Earth. How about right. uh, ships or submarines? How does that communication? Submarines, I think, might be more of a challenge because of uh, uh, the waves getting absorbed. Yeah, so um, normally submarines and, and aircraft carriers are all military and they're restricted. Um, you can only do it on Armed Forces Day if okay. they wish it, if they want to do that. Usually they do. That's the only time you can talk to those military vessels. But, this, for example, a cruise ship, yeah. I do it all the time. I mean, when I go on cruises, I take my radio with me. Uh -huh. And everybody gets a blast out of it. And I've spoken to cruise ships crossing the Atlantic and going down to um, South America. And I've talked to cruise ships in Alaska. So, yes, that you can do. Okay. okay. You're welcome. Um, I told you early on that we can bounce our signals off of almost everything. And you can, if there's a meteor uh, scatter, a meteorite, um, a meteor. Uh, close by, you can bounce your signal off of that. It's very common to bounce your signals off of the moon, and um, it's very easy to go a couple of thousand miles, no problem. Okay? All right, one special criteria is radio control. Some of us are into radio control models. I happen to be one of them. Um, certain radio controlled um, transmitters uh, transmit at greater than one watt, which is the legal limit, and um, it allows you to have different frequencies that are not congested, and to that you need to be an amateur radio operator, and the deal on that is you must have a sign on your transmitter, radio control, with your call sign. Okay, so you take out your label maker, you put your call sign on it, you stick it on there, and you can get um, a different class of radio control transmitter. Okay. All right. And that's what we need to know on that. Okay. Any questions on this? We're going to finish tonight. So we're going to go right through this. All right. Um, this is going to be I can bring out the a last class. We... Yes. Go ahead. What was your okay, question? Okay. This is sir? Bob in uh, Indianapolis. Um, yes, sir. When you're talking about you're talking about talking to the satellites versus uh, the space station. Are there people? Uh -huh. on the, are there people on these satellites, or what is this? Yeah, yeah. So amateur radio operators all over the world target their antennas at a specific satellite, and I think I demonstrated that to you. Uh, it's easy to track them. The, the software that I use tracks it automatically. Um, also, there's a thousand million gazillion websites that track it for you. I'll show you what that looks like. <clears throat> and the whole idea is uh, to bounce it off of a specific satellite that you want to reach an area that you want. So, for right. example, let's That's say I good. wanted to talk to Japan. You know, um, I could certainly pick a satellite um, that was talking that. This happens to be one satellite. These are all the satellites that I can choose from currently. And they add more every day. It's a huge list. Okay. 
So depending on where I am, this little house here is my where I live. All right, I would pick a particular satellite, and I can get information on that satellite. Okay, and it'll tell me where it is, how far it is away from me. Okay, like you can see this real-time feed. It tells you that it's a thousand eleven miles from me, and it's at four hundred nine miles up. And if I can reach that satellite, the idea is to take it, bounce a signal off of it, take and bounce a signal off of it, and let's say it's going to re reach here. I can go to England, I can go to, it's very simple to, do, not very simple, but it, it's it's certainly viable. The satellite's moving along pretty quick. Okay, so normally you have an antenna that tracks that satellite. Okay, and this particular piece of software is so advanced that if I had an antenna with a motor on it that rotates, I could ask my rotating um, antenna to track that satellite, and it would automatically adjust and change depending on where I wanted to reach. So the antenna would physically move the Yagi antenna, directional antenna, to track that particular satellite. And Depending on the satellite you reach, uh, again, there are websites that, that, ha that handle this. Um, here's another satellite, and the list goes on and on. And you can actually make arrangements uh, to talk to different countries. For example, talking to India is very, very popular. Talking to Japan, very popular. Talking to um, uh, North Pole, very near the North Pole, South Pole. Um, you can talk to them as well, okay? And this area here that's highlighted gives it gives you its effective range. So if I could reach this satellite, for example, I could actually talk into Russia. This is Russia here. I could certainly talk to Alaska, okay, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's the purpose of that. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yes. Yeah. That, I guess that was the thing. I was confused when you said talking to satellites. We are yeah, announcing yeah. we're using that satellite. Yeah. So when I say talking, I mean all modes. So you can do CW, you can do phone, you can do digital modes. Okay. That's what I mean by talking when I say talking. It can be any one of those things. So I can use Morse code. I can actually pick up the microphone and try talking to them. I can use RIDI or PSK31 and we could talk keyboard to keyboard. I could use WinLink. Um, there's a bunch of, whole bunch of different ways. Whatever, whatever you like the best, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, licensing terms, all right, so we're gonna talk about rules and regulations. Your license is good for 10 years, period, end of sentence. That's a question on the test, okay? 10 years, that's, uh, that's the way it is. We are governed by part 97 of the FCC regulations. All right, so if they throw that at you, don't worry. Those are the rules that we live by, okay? And um, the purpose of these rules and regulations is to, um, right here, voluntary non-commercial non communication system, emergency communications. Just so you know, okay, I live in Long Island, New York, and this morning, the Deputy Director of Emergency Services for Nassau County, the county I live in, was just arrested. I have no faith in, I have to tell you, to be honest, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody, I have no faith in the Nassau County Emergency Services Department. I don't know about where you live, I wouldn't trust these guys for the dollar, okay? So, and, and it's, not only that they're just not cognizant of how big an emergency can be, but even if they were, it's impossible to deal with all the emergency situations. Superstorm Sandy, which wasn't even a hurricane, did very considerable damage on Long Island. We had no power for two weeks. Okay, actually, I looked out, because I'm right at the junction, my house had power, but every house around me had no power although I was without power for a couple of days. And as I said, the first thing my wife and I did is we went through four blocks 
and we told everybody, we're amateur radio operators. In case you need police, fire, ambulance, let me know, okay, and I can get them here. Without that service that my wife and I provided, okay, and my, my son's also a ham, he lives six houses down, without that service, heaven forbid you needed an ambulance, how are you going to get them? How are you going to call them? And remember, there was no cell phone, there was no landline phone, the, the cell towers were down, no power, no fuel, because there was no power to, put, to pump gasoline. How are you going to get an ambulance? So the point is, a large part of what we do is emergency communication, and I think the federal government is aware of that. Okay, That's why they give us all of these frequencies to play with. Those Jeff, frequencies, if they, if they put it on the market, would be worth billions of dollars. Yes, sir. During the course of this, did you actually get requests to yes. emergency services? Yes. yes, yes, we handled three. Wow. Three, three ambulance services, yes. And remember, we're die-hide New Yorkers. Have you ever seen The Sopranos, right? So we're not, <laughs> we're not The Sopranos, but you know, we're die-hide New Yorkers. It can't ever happen here. What are you, what are you talking about? It's not going to happen. Guess what? Very humbling experience. It happened. Yeah. So yeah, we did. We had to call the police once and two ambulances, which so the police call. So there's a couple of opinion. questions in the chat yeah. room. Yeah. Um, what is Part 15? Oh, all right. Uh, part 15. So Part 15 is another part that covers non-license. For example, GRMS radios, FRMS radios. Um, those are the radios that have much limited range and the ones you can buy in Costco. The other question was Antarctica. Very close. Very close to Antarctica. Not Antarctica itself. I've never spoken to them. Uh, I do know of somebody who allegedly did speak to them, somebody I trust. And yeah, South Pole. Very close to the South Pole. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, so keep that in mind. Okay. And to be honest with you, um, in every class I've taught, I've taught a lot of these, I always get somebody, some first responders, especially in California, okay? I understand that California, if they cut down a tree in Oregon, the power goes out in California. And I have sheriff's departments constantly um, taking these classes, uh, uh, fire departments all over the country, because guess what? They've had the experience. I can't emphasize that enough, okay? So, and that's part of your responsibility as being amateur radio operators. It's good for you, it's good for your family, it's good for your neighbor, it's good for your community, and for your country, okay? All right, cool. Um, and that's why you have to go through this whole process. That's why you have to learn about antennas and capacitors and inductors, because it's not just CB, okay? You don't just buy it and start talking because you're very limited there, okay? Here you have much more power, you can go further, you understand the theories, the basic theories of electronics, you know that higher is better on the antenna, okay? You know how to build, you know what a two meter antenna is gonna look like, you know how to build a, uh, a 70 centimeter antenna, you know how to build a 20 meter antenna if you have to, right? 60 feet, about 60 feet. It may not be the world's best antenna, but you know what? In a pinch, it's going to it's going to work for you. Okay, that's why we go through this process. All right, cool. So they go into all the stuff, uh, what it's all about, all the different parts, blah 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 blah. It's all great. You can read about it at your leisure. Three types of licenses, right? So there's technician, which is what you're on. Is Lou on? Hold on. This is kind of a little private joke. Yeah, Lou is on. So Lou N2RQ is my cohort in crime, okay? And it really upsets him if I say tech, okay? So I'm not gonna say tech, technician. So it's technician, general, and extra, right? As I told you the first day, technician, don't hurt yourself. Um, general, don't kill the neighbor's dog. Don't nuke the neighbor's dog. And the third is, you get to get the white robes and climb to the top of the mountain and all of you guys come and talk to you, okay? That's the three types. And in all seriousness, the difference is we have different uh, operating privileges, right? And I told you, you want to stay in your class because 
if you're a technician and you go someplace where only extras can go, and I do a QSO with you, QSO with you, and I find out you're a technician, I can't log that. It's invalid, and you're going to upset me. <coughs> okay? All right. Um, this is what your license looks like. They used to mail it to you. They don't anymore. What you will do is when you pass your exam, and I know you will all pass, you'll go to the FCC website, and in a few days you'll see your name, put in your name, and your FRN number, if you have it, and it'll tell you that you passed your test, and it will give you your call sign. Okay? And as of that moment, when it appears on the FCC website, you can legally transmit. I repeat, and guess why I repeat? Somebody tell me why I'm repeating this. Everybody is asleep? Uh, that's a question. Because it's, it's on the test. test. It's on the test. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's on the on test. test. Okay? So you can't transmit until your name appears in the FCC. Uh, yeah. Wayne, you got it right. Uh, and then Kenneth says, are you supposed to be able to choose your call sign? <coughs> no, you can't initially choose your call sign. They assign you one, and then you can apply for a vanity. It's called a vanity call, and they used to charge you 5 or $10, um, and now it's free. So you can apply for a different call sign if it's not taken. Okay? So, for example, my original call many, many years ago was KD2 BMP. I didn't like the KD2. It was too too many things to put in, I changed it to W2 BMP. My wife, her name is Cecilia Teresa Gomez, and she changed it to W2 CTG. It happened to be available. Okay? So this is what your license looks like, okay? And this is your operating privileges, okay? And your call sign will be there, and this is your call sign. It looks just like this, but they've gotten really cheap. And they don't mail it to you anymore, so you get to print it out. Okay? All right, cool. And then it comes in two parts, okay? And you cut down here. The top part is the license you keep at your station. The bottom part you fold and stick in your wallet or your purse, okay? And that's in case of a problem. This is a federally issued license. Um, in New York, for example, there's some debate as to whether you can use a ham radio, because in New York, you can't use uh, anything but Bluetooth, um, you know, wireless communications. There is case law saying that amateur radios are exempt. Do I believe that? Uh, the jury's still out on that. But anyway, if you show it to the police officer, he might cut you a break, or maybe not. <clears throat> okay. Um, Joe, I'm I'm wondering. Um, you said ten years you get it renewed. Do you have to take the class again, or nope. or just nope. apply, or nope? You, they'll send you a communication, usually a letter saying a license is coming up for renewal. You have two years after the ten years to renew your license. They want to know where you are. Okay. The law specifically says if you move, you must let the FCC know. Okay. They want to know who you are, where you are, and that you're still around. Okay? And sometimes, unfortunately, as, as life is, if an amateur radio operator passes away, we call that a silent key. So the FCC wants to know about that. But yeah, you don't have to take any more exams or anything else. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, um, here's the um, exams. So you're going to be taking the technician. 35 questions, 26 is correct. General is the same thing. That's uh, element three. 35 questions, 26 correct. And of course, because you're going to be the amateur extra, um, that's a little bit harder. That's 50 um, questions, 37 correct to pass. And really, um, they just get a little bit more in depth as you go up, okay? because they give you more power, they give you more privileges, um, they give you a lot of other stuff. They want you, they want to feel good about you know what you're doing. Okay? All right, cool. Um, examinations, 
774 questions in an exam pool. Uh, there were five different exams, all right? Uh, and the five different exams are rotated, so you can't copy from the guy sitting next to you. And they, they kind of mix them up. Uh, at the end of that, they give you paper. Uh, you have to bring, normally they have pencils, but bring some anyway, number two pencil. You fill in the right, they're all multiple choice. Um, you fill it out, you bring your, you need your, either your driver's license and your social security number, or your driver's license and your FRN number, $15 cash or check, okay, it's fine, and bring your pencils and bring your calculator. The calculator, I recommend it. You may not, you may not use your cell phone as a calculator. Okay, negative, negative, negative. There's at least three um, volunteer examiners. We call them VE for short, volunteer examiners. Normally there's more than that, okay? And uh, we sit there and we're pretty quiet while you take your exam. When you're finished, you just let us know. You bring your exam up, we grade them, and three of us have to agree that you pass the test because we make mistakes. You know, everybody makes mistakes. So in case in just a minute, okay? So everybody yep, understand yep, that? Yep. I have yes. a quick question. Sure, uh, sure. When do you tell them if you want to take the general at the same time as the tech? So as soon as you pass, as soon as you pass um, the technical, they'll ask you, do you wish to take the general exam? And they'll mention to you, it's free. Hmm. Why not take it, right? Even if you fail it, and just so you get an idea of what's there. I sent everybody the, the uh, general um, study sheet, okay? It doesn't replace, you know, the actual studying, but it certainly will get you through. I recommend, if you have the time, is um, hang out. So tonight is, our, is the last of the manual. Tuesday, next Tuesday, we're going to just review some exams. I'll give you some tips on how to take the exams. And then I'm going to have two more classes after that for those of you that want to try the, the general. I don't promise 100% pass rate, but I think you'll do better. The reason I recommend it, and there's a big controversy here, okay? Uh, some, some instructors say, no, don't teach the general. Some instructors say, yes. Taking the general, if you, got, if you had a chance to look at the general study sheet, it's only two pages, as opposed to all the pages you got for the technician. A lot of the questions are exactly the same. So what I'm suggesting to you, and I've tracked it very carefully, if you didn't study one second for the general exam, you will get 10 or 15 questions correct on the general, because the questions are the same. You know, what does 3 dB mean? What does 6 dB mean? Okay, what does 10 dB mean? Um, how long is your license good for? So a lot of the questions are the same. <laughs> Excuse me. Why not take it? It's free. You've already spent the 15 bucks. Why not take it and at least try it? If you're not comfortable with that or you're having trouble with what we've considered so far, then don't take it. But in my opinion, it's worth a shot. With a little bit of studying, you can do well on it. Okay? And you can take both. And you walk out with not only your technicians, but your general as well. So oh. don't, don't try that for your extra, okay? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Joe. <laughs> question. Yes, sir. Can I, I'd like to ask you a question that has not to do necessarily with passing the test. Assuming for a moment that you pass the test, uh, yeah. do any of the local uh, clubs, uh, do they tend to mentor you for a while so that you get used to, like, not breaking any laws and things like that? Yeah. 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 Most clubs will. Most clubs will. My club absolutely does, too. Um, it's kind of an informal thing, 
um, the best thing to do is to listen to the nets in your area. Every club has a net. Certainly listen to Aries. Okay. I want you all to consider looking up Aries in your location. So let's say um, you know, and you just Google Aries, Michigan City, Indiana. Okay and it'll tell you where there's an Aries group nearby. Even if you don't want to, to join Aries, I understand that everybody's busy. At least know who they are, tell them who you are, okay, and that you're not ready to join at this time. And listen in, they'll tell you what repeater they're on and when they're on. For example, here in Nassau County, we meet Monday nights at 8 p.m. every Monday night. And even if you all don't want to participate, at least listen. And that's a great way to learn how to handle things. Okay, so the answer is yes. Okay. Most clubs will mentor you. We have a mentoring program in our club as well. Okay. All right, cool. So you get this form called the 605. Here it is sideways. Okay. Um, and it tells you, uh, I can't read it sideways. Hold on, let's see if I can. Rotate view counterclockwise. Here we go. Oh, yeah. So you fill out this form here on the right, all right? And once you pass this um, exam, they issue you this form here, whether, whether you pass or fail. You get this form, and it's signed. Let's put it back to the way it was. <clears throat> all right, so it tells you the element that you, that you took, all right? And then you have these VEs sign. I happen to be a VE. Um, Lou and 2 rq is a VE who's monitoring this class to make sure I do everything right. My wife's in VE. Um, so you have plenty of VEs. They'll sign it, give their call sign, and you cannot transmit until your name appears in the FCC database. Is that perfectly clear? Perfectly, perfectly clear. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. Good. So that's one question I know you're going to ace, right? All right. Good. That's the reason I said it. Okay. And then how to find your call sign? Just go to the FCC's Universal Licensing System, and your type in, put in your name or your FRN code, and it'll tell you your status. Okay. You'll know on the spot that you passed or failed. Okay. And then once you've passed, then you got to wait a couple of days. All right. Some clubs uh, now file electronically, and you get your call within 48 hours, which is awesome. Uh, when I first took my technician's exam, uh, they lost they they lost my uh, my exam, and this was my only proof that I passed. So you hold on to this form, okay? And I had to submit it back to the FCC, and it took them two weeks to find my license, but I finally took it. They finally found it, and um, so hold on to this. Don't you know? Don't throw this form away. Okay. All right. Cool. So the licensing is given by the ARRL, hence the reason we use their textbook. Okay. Amateur licenses are good for how long? I forget. Ten years. All right. Cool. All right. And that's another question on the test. So whenever you see this little number, that's a question on the test. All right? All right, cool. And if 10 years goes by, uh, you still have another two years grace period, and uh, you can restore your license without taking any more exams. Okay? Unauthorized operation. Ham radios are available to anybody who has money. Uh, sometimes you'll get uh, people who shouldn't be on the radio. Um, you have to be careful with that, right? So we don't ever engage somebody who's not licensed. How will you know? They will not give you their call sign because that's a federal offense to use somebody else's call sign. And you want to be careful, if you, especially if you have small children in the house, you don't want them operating your equipment uh, without licenses, okay? So family members and that kind of stuff. So got to be careful with that. All right. All right. So again, I strongly recommend that you apply for an FRN number, federal registration number. All right. This way, you don't have to use your social security number. All right. Uh, station inspection. 
The FCC has the right to inspect your station at any time for anything, and it makes sense. Okay. Remember that as, as you move up in class, you have more and more power. Even with your technician privileges, you can talk to almost anybody on the planet. Okay. So the FCC, if they suspect something, they reserve the right, whether you're licensed or not licensed, they don't care. They have the right to inspect your station at any time. It's for your security and my security. Okay? So, yes, yeah. Yes, you have a question? Yeah. You're, you're saying they can, they can knock on your door any time, day and night, and come into your house? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've never heard it happening, ever. But technically, yeah, they do. Wow. To inspect your station. Yeah. Oh, no, I, yeah. I understand. It's possible. I've never heard of it. Uh, and I'm going to ask Lou, who's been doing this a lot longer than I have, and he's going to respond. He's going to text me his message. Lou, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody um, that um, that uh, the FCC has broken down the door or knocked on the door to look at a station. And he'll answer me. Uh, some Wayne asked, Joe, does the FCC recycle call signs? Yes, sometimes. Yes, sometimes. Uh, after 25 years, they normally do, unless you request it. Okay. Um, so, for example, if your father was a ham or something, and and heaven forbid he passed away, and you want to preserve that, or you want to recall that license, you want to become that call sign. You you have that ability. Wayne says, never trust New York City. They think they stand alone from the rest of the state. You got that right, Wayne. Hundred yeah, percent. Never trust the New York City government. It goes for Nassau County. There are different call sign groups that may be applied on the different classes of license. Um, my one by two is an extra class. Yeah, we're going to consider that in a minute, Lou. Thank you. Um, and Lou, I agree. You have to lose by taking the next. What do you have to? Oh, Lou. Lou is is my hero, by the way. He's the co-chairman of our education department, and I listen very carefully when Lou talks. Okay, so he says he agrees with me. What do you have to lose by taking the next exam in the same session for the same fee? You got nothing to lose. All right. All right. And then, um, if you pass the exam, Lou saying. If you pass the exam, you may choose to take the next level exam without paying another fee for the same session. Okay, so Lou, you're handling all of the you're handling all of the the uh, text messages. Lou says, "I have heard that they have done raids, but I have never known anybody who received such a visit. They will knock they will knock down your door if you're transmitting pirate stations. There are pirate stations on FM, regular commercial FM, so they reserve that right." or if they suspect anything, okay? And that power has been increased legally. Um, I used to be a lawyer before I, uh, I decided to get a real job, so I follow the law quite a bit. Um, Homeland Security has given them a lot more power, and Homeland Security and vice versa, the FCC has given Homeland Security. Think of the implications of you know, this kind of ability in the wrong hands. Somebody had a question? What's a pirate station? So uh, you, your favorite FM station, right, you're listening to in the car, well, people will come on without a license and start transmitting music and commercials and whatever they want to do without having any license whatsoever. They erect a tower and they put antenna up and they start transmitting music without a license or commercials or ball games or whatever. Those are pirate stations. Okay, it's become a big, big problem. Big problem, especially here in New York. Um, okay, working with the FCC. Um, the FCC website allows you to change your um, address if you're going to move. Um, it's going to, you can renew your licenses. You can search for other call signs. You can go to the FCC, type in my call sign, um, and to make sure you're talking to somebody legitimate. All right? All right, cool. That's what it involves. And this is what the website looks like, the universal licensing system. And uh, it works great. Works fine. Using your FRN, again, I recommend you use your FRN at the, um, at the exam. Bans and privileges, okay. This is the ban plan on this page. 
You'll know where you can and cannot go. Okay. I had trouble memorizing where I could and couldn't go, and that's why I went for my extra. All right, and I said, ah, it's too much work. All right. All right, cool. Stay within your stay within your um, privileges. Okay. Then they talk about uh, the frequency ranges for different bands. All right. The ones I want you to know is I want you to know um, th these guys here. Okay. Two meters, 70 centimeter. That's 440. Right. So I want you to know these guys here, all right? Two meter, 1.25 meter. There's only one of the exams mentions 1.25 meter, um, so it's not too popular. Uh, but two meters, 70 centimeters, I guarantee you will have a question. They'll say, 443, 525, what band is that on? And you're going to say 70 centimeters, because you know it, right? They're going to say 146, 850 is what? and you're going to know two meters, okay? And if it's not something you recognize, it's probably 1.25 meters, okay? They don't ask you too much about the other stuff. This is um, the technician privileges on HF. They are very limited. They are very limited. And there is one band, Ronald. Yes, sir. There is one band that you can never, ever, ever use phone. You can never use voice. What band is that? Uh, yeah, you can use CW. You can use, you can use data. You can... Right. What band is that? 10. And... Oh. Okay. Wayne, what do you say? What band is that, Wayne? I think Wayne left us. Oops. All right. Uh, let's talk to Dana. Hey, Dana. Yes. What band can you not use phone? 30 meter, if my memory That's is correct. That's it. Yeah, know that, guys. It's a question on the test. Okay? 30 meters, no phone. No phone. Phone-o, no-o, 30 meters. Okay? Hey, Joe, looking at what's up there right now, on yep. the 80, 40, 15, and 10 meter, we can't yep. talk on them. Um, yeah. Yeah. None of those yeah. we can actually... On 10, meters, on 10 meters, you can, actually. On 10 meters, you can. Okay, there's some okay. little band in there? Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Because to reach those bands, okay, you need a little bit more technical knowledge. And they don't want you hurting yourself or your family or setting fire to your house, that kind of stuff. There's a reason for it. Okay. I never understood it either, but you know, when I was at that level, but as you get into it, you'll see the reason why, okay? Perfect. You need a little bit more. That's why I suggest go for the general. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff opens up for you. Uh, HF, as soon as you hit your general, you have a lot more, um, a lot more privileges on HF, okay? All right, cool. So I'm just curious yes. on the why is there two different categories and just like the 20 to 22 megahertz is missing? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it skips because uh, on 1.25 meters, they use it for other things. The forestry department, for example, uses 1.25 meters, okay? But they use 221, which is specifically excluded from our use, okay? That's the reason. Because they needed, HF was too too much for them, 2 meter wasn't enough for them, 70 centimeter wasn't enough, so we have to give up a couple of frequencies for Uncle Sam and uh, the people that they uh, that they employ, okay? Hey, Joe. Just like 30 meters, I'm sorry to interrupt, but 30 meters is specifically for that reason. They only want you to use digital modes, only digital modes, because we share it. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, I was just looking back at the 1.25 meter, uh, the 219 uh -huh. to 2, 219 to 220. Isn't that for like uh -huh. the CW only? Yeah, you usually at the beginning of the band. Generally, at the beginning of the band, it's for CW, and sometimes digital, and then voice after that, phone after that. Yes, that's true of all the bands. Okay. Okay. Generally. Okay. Except for 30 meters, because we know we can't use phone on 30 meters. All right. Cool. Um, 
So they talk about admission privileges. Um, you, so you have admission privileges is where you can talk to somebody and how you can talk to them. So as a technician, you can get on 80 meters. You can only use CW. That's to encourage you, okay, if you stay technician, to learn CW. All right? CW is the most, it hasn't changed, okay? CW um, will get through no matter what. I can, I can transmit on CW using a battery, two pieces of wire, and an antenna made out of wire. It, it's that efficient, okay? You can talk to the world, to the entire planet. I know guys who have done it. On half a watt, half a watt, you can talk to anybody on CW. It's really the most efficient way to do it. So they want you to encourage to encourage you on CW. Um, and the reason is, if there's an emergency, you should at least know how to send SOS by CW, because your phone, you know, handy talkie by voice isn't going to make it. And Lou has a comment, I think. All right, uh, Lou. Operating privileges um, are, are partly controlled by the international law and history. There was a big fight over 1.25 meter band. It's changed at least twice. Yes, and I agree. Um, so anyway, um, so emission privileges, make sure you know what privileges you have. For example, on 10 meters here, you can use um, RIDI and digital modes on top of CW. And uh, down here, you can use single sideband. Okay, they're trying to entice you. Okay, all right, cool. That's all that means. All right, and we know, and we know, um, uh, CW means Morse code, data, image, uh, tone modulate. They don't really use that too much anymore. Phone, ready, single sideband. Okay, those are the different modes, and that's what we have um, privileges for. You're allowed maximum 1,500 watts. PEP stands for peak envelope power. Okay, um, I don't suggest you worry about that too much for right now. Uh, take your general and understand general. But anyway, those are just another way of seeing your privileges. Okay, uh, with 200 watts maximum peak envelope power, your class. This is what you can use: 80 meters, 40 meters, 15 meters, so forth and so on on HF. You buy a radio out of the box, they normally have a maximum of 100 watts, okay? To go more than that, you will need an amplifier. Um, and even if you buy a 100-watt radio, the limit is on radios, okay? The radio will self-limit on 2 meter and 70 centimeter. I don't know that any radio does not. Mine certainly does. The maximum that the radio will put out on 2 meters is 50 watts and 20 watts on uh, 70 centimeters, okay? You don't need it. You really don't need the power, okay? And they do that so it doesn't overheat on you, okay? So they talk about peak envelope power, and that's the measure that they use, and it's the power when you press the transmit key, how much power is being pushed out, okay? So you are limited, okay, to 200 watts, on 30 meters, you're limited to um, 200 watts on HF bands, but you don't have a lot of privileges, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Stations operating in the 70 centimeter band are limited to 50 watts PEP, but most radios won't even produce that, okay. My radio, for example, will only go to 20 watts, okay, and it's more than I need. It's much more than I need, okay. All right, cool. Uh, primary and secondary allocations, this goes to answering your question. How come there's some gaps? Because we share, okay? We share, for example, um, with the forestry department, big time, okay? For example, you'll learn when you take your general, if you use a dipole antenna and you exceed a certain distance, the forestry department wants to know about it, okay? Uh, so we do share the bands. All right, and they talk about this stuff here as well, not part of the exam, okay? The band plan, it's made by some mythical person, I don't know, someplace, and he develops the hand plan, and as Lou said, they talk about the band plan, they fight about it, and the politicians fight about it, and 
whatever, and they come up with the band plan on a regular interval. And they say, well, you can't go here, you can't go there. We still have an enormous bandwidth to play with. Okay? Repeater coordination. Um, this is, remember that when we have a repeater, we need to know the listening frequency and the input frequency, right? And there is a coordination council that decides, we call them pairs, frequency pairs, because every repeater has a pair, right? Uh, and there's a council that comes up with them. Again, not on the exam, don't need to know it, okay? International rules, we are governed by the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, okay? And that's where we get our phonetic alphabet from. It's called the ITU phonetic alphabet. All right. And they're in Sweden or, well, I don't know, where, where are they, Lou? Sweden or, I don't know, Geneva or someplace. And they come up with the rules governing who can talk to who. Okay. What you need to know, okay, question on the test. We are in ITU region number two. Okay. North and South America, including Alaska and Hawaii, Region 2. So when they ask you what region of the ITU you're in, you're in Region 2. Okay? There's a map that comes on a little bit right here. So it's divided into three regions. Okay? This dark part here is where we are. Okay? Region 1 is part of Europe up to Russia. And then you have India, China, Australia is Region 3, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So we're in Region 2. I'm going to say it one more time. We're in ITU Region 2. All right? International operations. So we have this agreement with most countries. Okay? And um, if you're going to travel outside of the country, it's great to um, get this CEPT license. It allows you to transmit uh, in most other country, European countries without obtaining any additional license. That CEPT is only available to general, general and extra class licensees. Okay, it's not available for technicians. Because the, the laws are different in Europe, outside of the United States. And they want you to make sure that you're, you know what you're doing a little bit more. Okay? All right, um, Lou had pointed out call signs. Every person's call sign is absolutely unique. It has a prefix and a suffix, okay? So, for example, after a while, you will not know my name, my last name, okay? You'll say Joe, W2VMP. Kind of replaces your last name, okay? So you are, you know, Seal, W2CTG. Nobody cares about a last name, okay, anymore. As a matter of fact, I think she signed uh, the checks that way, our, our personal checks, all right? And uh, they talk about the different call signs here. Okay, and depending on your class uh, that you have, you can apply for different um, different prefixes. Okay, and they, I'll go into that in just a minute. This is how the United States is divided up. Okay, so I'm in Region Two. Okay, here in New York. So wherever you are, you can figure out what what your zone is. Okay, your district. All right. And here is how they decide the uh, call signs, generally, generally, okay? So um, depending on what you have, um, what license you have, you can uh, pick specific uh, call signs. A lot of extras will pick A, okay, because it's not available on uh, technician or general, okay? and they want everybody to know that they're an extra, okay? And they should, they work really hard. Um, Lou, for example, N2RQ, okay? It's two by one, okay? So one letter suffix, it's called a two letter uh, prefix. All right, and you should take a look at that a little bit because I think they ask you, a, um, you know, they have a bogus call sign and they ask you if it's legal or not legal, okay? Also, it helps you pick up if somebody's not really being on the up and up. Okay, uh, your license is Joe, portable. Yes. Joe, uh, question. Sure. Uh, on the uh, tutorial, the online tutorial you, you told us about, they yeah. asked a lot of questions about uh, vanity call signs. Yeah. Strangely enough. So, 
Yeah, so vanity is very simple. Once you get your call sign, go back to the same place, the FCC Universal Licensing System, and ask for a vanity call. And, they'll, and you put in whatever call you want, and it'll tell you if they can do it or not. Lou, do they still have the restriction for A calls, for example, for technicians they can't use A's? I defer to my colleague who has more experience in that area than I do. I was happy with the W, so I can get W as a technician. So I'm waiting for his answer. Anyway, your license is, while we're waiting for Lou to respond, um, your license is portable, okay? And a lot of people like telling them, telling you what region they're in so they'll have their call sign slash and a number. So I could say W2BMP slash three if I wanted to. Um, I don't think it's necessary, okay? Um, uh, question? Yes. Uh, at what time you get to pick the call sign format or is it something uh, on on the form then when you, you fill yeah, up any so No, no, no. When you pass the test, the next step is you'll have to wait a few days. You'll go to the FCC licensing, universal licensing system, and they will have given you a call. I think they're up to K, KD2, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So it'll probably be something like KD2 something, something, something. At that moment in time, as soon as you see the, the call that they've assigned to you, you have the option to apply for a vanity call. Okay? And you can change it. Oh, okay. As long as it as long as it meets the legal requirement. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. I like BMP because I'm a computer guy, and the BMP is a bitmap file, so I, it was easy to remember. Everybody knows BMP. All right. Cool. Um, and you will see that uh, if you d decide not to take the general exam at the same time you take the technician exam, you pass the technician exam, right? Okay. A month later, you decide to take the general exam, okay? The moment you pass the general exam, you have general privileges. You do not have to wait for the FCC to record it in their database. What you do need to do is add that slash AG at the end, okay? AG means acting general, okay? Same thing, if you, have, if you pass your general, and you, a month or two or a year later you decide to take the extra and pass it, you keep your same call sign and you add slash AE so that I don't get upset with you when you're on 80 meters talking to me via phone, which you're not allowed to do. So if I look up your call sign you tell me slash AG or slash AE, I know that you've passed your extra, uh, that QSO is, is valid. Okay. And here they go into um, choosing your call sign, okay? This chapter here, okay? And it used to cost you $5 or $10, now it's free. So it's no longer any, any fee for uh, getting a vanity call sign. Okay, uh, clubs and special events. Um, so every club, every repeater, uh, every special event is assigned a special call sign, okay? And that call sign um, designates either the repeater or the event or whatever is happening. For example, we every year we um, have a special session where we celebrate the um, the crossing of Lindbergh, of his crossing the Atlantic, and we assign a special call sign to that. Hold on one minute, guys. Sorry about that. Um, another one is um, we had one commemorating 100 years of the sinking of Titanic. So we had a special event, special call sign. And that's worldwide, all right? So and we had another one just uh, last year, sinking of the Lusitania during World War II. Um, again, special event, special call sign, and everybody uses that call sign. We had a lot of uh, QSOs with... Um, Ireland and England, okay, and it was worldwide, and it's a ton of fun, okay. All right, any questions on that? Any of that stuff? We're good. So, All right. So if you have one of those special events, 
what do you talk about? I mean, so it's the well, you make contacts. You make yeah. So uh, a lot of different things depending on the event um, that occurs. For example, the Lindbergh event, you can we actually track where Lindbergh was from New York all the way to to Paris, and um, we talk to all the stations in between, like Newfoundland. Uh, we'll talk to Canada, and we'll plot. You know, just as a as a tribute to you know that great event. Um, same thing with the Titanic sinking. Um, you know, you can track exactly what's happening. And historically, if you're into history and and it, if you use your imagination, you can almost feel like you were there. You know, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And there's facts about that particular event and how it got going, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we're, we're in the home stretch here. Um, operating regulations, control operators, that's what you will be, okay? And the control operators means you control the machine, you control the radio. You are ultimately responsible for everything that goes on, okay? And you're the responsible for absolutely everything that goes on. So can't point the figure at anybody. A control point is where you control that machine, okay? And this is the definition. A control operator is the amateur designated as responsible for making sure that trans transmissions comply with the FCC rules, right? So if your brother-in-law shows up and gets on your radio and is arguing about something about his ex-girlfriend and calls her a so-and-so, and the FCC catches you, guess who's responsible? You are, okay? So they're not interested in him, they're only interested in you. And that's the way it goes, all right? All right, cool. Um, now, one of the cool things is that as the control operator, you can have other people working under your control, all right? So for example, you come to my house, right? and you want to try HF, as long as I'm watching over you, you have my privileges. You have extra privileges. All right? As soon as I leave the room, those privileges cease. Stop. Done. And if you screw up, I'm responsible. That's the easiest way to remember that. Okay? So they give you an example here. Uh, Elmer is Elmer is a horrible term, but it's kind of what I do. I'm helping you along here. So you come to my house, you have a technician class license or no license, okay? And you come to my house, and I'm watching over you, you have extra privileges, all right? However, if the Elmer decides to step out of the shack or the room and run an errand, you are restricted to whatever your privileges are. So if you have no license, you have no privileges. If you're a technician, you go back to technician privileges as soon as I walk out of the room. Okay? All right, cool. Unlicensed operator, uh, Joe, not a problem. Question. Yes, go ahead. Um, did yes. you say uh, even if you don't have a license uh, mm -hmm. under, you know, somebody's uh, um, control, yep. uh, somebody's control operating, you can still operate it? But in that yep. case, what call sign would they transmit when they are talking you, to? It, it, would be, it would be yours. Oh, okay. Okay? All right, got it. Thanks. So they're under your control. So you, you're really relinquishing that control to them. Okay? We do that all the time at field day. To get people interested in this, we have a thing called a go-to station. And people right off the street will come up and they'll start transmitting on HF on wherever they want as long as somebody's there to watch over them. And that license covers them. Okay? Thank you. Identification. We identify every 10 minutes, period, end of sentence, okay? I'll say that three times. So we identify every 10 minutes, and every 10 minutes we identify. And you know why I said it three times, right? Because it's on the test. Okay, normal identification. Hitting the transmit key is not sufficient. You must give your call sign every 10 minutes. You'll hear that when you're on, the, on any net, any conversation. You'll hear two people, it doesn't matter how passionate they are, they'll stop every 10 minutes and say W2BMP. <laughs> Gloria says, on test. You're right, Gloria, it's on the test. Okay? Repeaters will identify every 10, meter, 10 minutes. Okay? Tactical calls, okay? 
So when you work, for example, the marathon or cancer walk that we're working on this Sunday, we will not use our regular call signs. We'll use tactical calls, and those are calls that we make up. First aid station, waypoint three, delta two, blah, 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 okay? And then every 10 minutes, you're still required to give um, regular call signs, okay? Self-assigned indicators, we kind of discussed this already. So if you want to let people know where you're from, you can give this self-assigned indicators. Not on the exam, and it's, I find it confusing. Don't worry about it too much, okay? Upgrade indicators, we discussed that. If you pass your general, uh, you don't have to wait for, the only time you have to wait for your, license, your name to appear in the FCC database is for technician. After that, as soon as you pass the test, you have those privileges. The second they say you passed, you've got those privileges. Just add the slash AG or slash AE. Okay? All right, cool. And here they talk about it again. All right, guest operators. Okay, we just discussed that. You know how that works. Uh, identification okay. rules. Um, all right, so... Um, they may ask you, there is one test that does ask you uh, to define space station, okay? And space stations are, or, or satellites are uh, defined as anything that's more than 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface. There's only one test that asks you that, but now you know. Space station, satellites, 50 kilometers over the Earth's surface, all right? Um, test transmissions. You can do them, no problem. Actually, all you would do is hit the mic and say W2BMP requesting uh, radio check, and you're good to go. In CW, you use Vs, not on the test, just letting you know, okay? There are repeaters and radios. My radio will do that, for example. It will identify me automatically every 10 minutes, so I don't have to worry about it so much, all right? Special event stations, not on the test. Special event stations, I talked to you about it. Um, cancer walk, um, Lindbergh, sinking of the Titanic, uh, moon landing, all of these are special event stations, okay? All right, interference. I told you the two that you had to remember. QRM for man-made, QRN for natural, okay? Interference will occur. It will occur. Nothing you can do about it. Either some bozo is going to get on, okay, that wants to talk to his family on Jupiter, or you'll get natural made interference, okay, that's possible. That's all part of this, okay. So amateur radio is a science, but it's also an art. You know, how to get around that. And that's part of the training process that you go through in case there's an emergency. How do you deal with that? Do you make your antenna higher? Do you get it up higher? Do you put up a, a dipole? You know, what do you do? You use that RIT, receiver incremental tuning. You know, how do you deal with that? That's all part of it, okay? All right, harmful interference. Um, you don't want to interfere with anything. Not so big of a problem anymore because everybody's on cable, but if you're not on cable, you can interfere with your neighbor's um, TV. Um, occasionally, okay? Uh, be ready for that. And if you don't know what to do, send me an email. I'll help you out, okay? Again, we don't want to upset our neighbors, so if there's a problem, work with them. They don't understand. They don't understand how important this is, okay? All right, cool. Um, willful interference, we call it jamming. Those are, there are some very strange people that will transmit just to, just to upset you. Never, ever, ever engage them. In my club, uh, engaging uh, somebody who's willful, willfully interfering is grounds to have your membership suspended. Why? Because we're out tracking them, okay? We want these people off the air. And we will report them to the FCC, all right? Third-party communications, okay? And that's where you have two ham radio operators, you and I are talking, and you're sending a message 
you want me to relay a message to somebody else. Okay, it's called third-party communications. All right, not too much about this on the exam. Okay, I do suggest you read the definitions and the rules, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I only have half an hour left, and we have another chapter to cover. Okay, so when you can use third-party communications and when you can't. All right, this is the list of all the countries at the time of the writing of this manual that we have agreements with. I happen to be of Cuban descent, okay? And Cuba, until just recently, you couldn't go see and, you know, the whole Castro thing. However, I had full privileges to talk to people in Cuba, all right? And this list changes all the time, okay? And the FCC, you can go to the FCC website and it lists all the countries that we have agreements with. The only countries we currently do not have agreements with is Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and North Korea that I'm aware of. Okay? The top on the list is North Korea. They don't want you talking to North Korea. Please don't talk to anybody from North Korea. They're going to get very upset with you if you do. Okay? All right. And you can go through this, but most countries are represented, and it's usually not a problem. All right? They talk about uh, remote and automatic operation. So local control is the radios in front of you, and you can operate it by just moving your hand, like we've been doing throughout the class, locally controlled. Remote operation is I'm not controlling the specific radio in the same room that I'm in. I can operate it by remote control. Okay. Now, the operator, if I, for example, I have a radio in my office, right? If I want to use that radio, I can do that. So the radio isn't physically in the same location, but by remote control, I can operate that radio. However, I'm responsible because I'm at the control point. So I'm controlling the radio that's two miles away, but I'm responsible for what's happening because I am at the control point. Sometimes you can do that via internet, phone lines, you can do it a bunch of different ways, um, and that's what they mean by remote operation. Automatic operation, for example, a perfect example of that is um, repeaters. They just operate, okay? Now, they're under remote control, but they operate automatically. They identify automatically, They'll switch frequencies automatically, and some of these are repeaters, beacons, space stations, all automatically uh, controlled. Oh, one thing about the space station, absolutely a question on the test. They're going to ask you when you can transmit music. They love to ask that question. The answer to that is only when you're authorized to wake up the astronauts, and they do it all the time. So you'll get a communication. They'll ask for volunteers, and you can transmit music up to the International Space Station. That's the only time an amateur radio operator can transmit music on the air legally. Okay? I meant to tell you that. Okay. Responsibilities. Okay. Um, you have to always operate within the FCC rules. No excuses. They don't want to hear it. It has no validity. You can give whatever excuse you want. The only excuse will be in case of an emergency. Emergency is defined as a threat to life or property, an imminent threat to life or property. Then do whatever you need to do. Okay? That's the law. All right, cool. Uh, prohibited transmission. Can't have anything coded. All right, so... First of all, you can't make any unidentified transmissions. You must identify. You can't have any code. You certainly can't have a false distress signal. You will piss off a lot of people. And you can't have obscene or indecent speech. Okay? Never say anything on the radio that you wouldn't send, say to a 10-year-old child. It's not acceptable. That's the general rule. All right? Business communications, no, 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 no business communications, okay? And they give you some examples here. They call it pecuniary interest. You cannot use amateur radio for pecuniary interest, okay? 
no encrypted transmissions of any kind. Think about it. It makes sense, right? So you're going to use our airways to send encrypted messages? No. Pick up the phone. All right? They will hunt you down. Homeland Security is big on this. Okay? So nothing encrypted. Very important. Broadcasting and, and retransmission. Again, this is uh, the pirate stations. You can't broadcast out to the general public. A broadcast is defined as a one-way transmission intended for the general public. You are not allowed to do that, except if it, they declare martial law, and you're authorized to do that. Okay? All right, cool. We can't send any, uh, any music or any of that stuff. The only exception to that is, and they, and they talk about it here, is when you're transmitting to the International Space Station. All right? Special circumstances. Basically what this says is, in case of an emergency, you do whatever you need to do. That's what this means. Okay? And the question was, um, can we talk to the armed forces? You can. Once a day. Okay? Uh, once a year, rather. Forces, armed Forces Day in May. Uh, and you do get pilots flying over in, in F-17s, and, uh, and they do talk to you. Most of them are amateur radio operators. All right. Any questions? We're good? Okay. Talking about safety, and we're done. Here's the, here's the bottom line here. Okay. I happen to be an engineer. So um, what I want you to understand is the power supply that powers your radio can quite easily kill you. Okay. If you open it up, there's these sucker capacitors. And we know capacitors store a lot of energy electrically. You don't need a lot of current to kill you. Okay? This is what will kill you. This 50 to 150 milliamperes. So that's a thousandth of an ampere. If you're not careful and you touch one of those power supplies on the inside, it could kill you. I want you to be careful. Okay? Doesn't take a lot. Even if it's been off for a while, okay, those capacitors store enormous amounts of energy. All right? I want you to be careful. Next thing is be careful with ground. You should have all of your equipment should be grounded and should be um, uh, hooked up to a good electrical outlet. Never assume that there is no current in your power supply or your radio. Never, ever, ever, okay, because it's not true, okay, because capacitors have a certain discharge rate. When you get into, uh, into your general and certainly your extra, as part of your extra, we can compute the discharge rate of capacitors over time, okay, so we want to be careful with that. All right, uh, and they talk about, um, well, they specifically talk about capacitors. Okay? Easily kill you. Be careful with them. Okay? Storage batteries, especially lithium ions, will explode if you don't handle them correctly. Be careful with your jewelry, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Response to electrical in injury. Should somebody, unfortunately, um, be electrocuted, you never touch them, right? You make sure that that power is off. And then you should also know, uh, get some CPR training in case that happens. Wayne says, remember that one one thousandth of an amp, your circuit in your ha house is 15 to 20 amps. Thank you, Wayne. That's exactly correct. We're talking about one one thousandth, 150 over one thousandth of, of an amp. So it's a tiny thing, can stop your heart. Your house normally has 15 to 20 amps. Thank you so much, Wayne. That's exactly correct. Okay. Um, you should learn, you can take CPR courses online. Everybody knows basic CPR, right? So the center of the chest, two hands together, and you know that song, Staying Alive, Staying Alive, you know, from the 80s? You pump the chest that way. There's no mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, required. At least that gets you going, and certainly dial 911 as soon as you can, okay? Um, AC safety grounding, 
grounding. Make sure that you have good ground uh, when you connect your machines. It's very important, especially during electrical storms as well. Okay, never go past the three-wire power cords. You know, some people cut off that extra third wire. Don't do that. Not, not a good idea. Okay. In case of a of a um, thunderstorm, always unplug your radio and disconnect your antenna. Very important because your antenna is a natural lightning rod. It's perfect for lightning. So you want to make sure that you unplug your radio, disconnect your antenna. Very important. RF burns. It's going to happen, folks. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to put up your first dipole, because I showed you how to make a dipole. And you're going to be outside, and you're going to call your significant other in the house. And you're going to say, hey, I want to see if this works. Hit the transmit button. Meanwhile, you're holding on to one of the wires of your dipole, you will get an RF burn. It will burn you. You'll only do it once, but everybody does it, right? So you touch the antenna, hit, <laughs> hit the transmit button. I promise you'll only do it once, okay? Lightning we just discussed, okay? And then I want to talk about this thing, RF exposure. So. Any radio, your cell phone, ham radio, they all emit RF radiation, okay? It's not the same as atomic radiation. It's non-ionizing radiation. So we work at a different spectrum. However, you need to know that your microwave, the stuff that cooks your dinner, is nothing more than a radio signal. It's produced by a special tube called a magnetron but it is radio frequencies. So although RF is non-ionizing radiation, I want you to be careful. I don't want you to grow another head. I don't want you to you know, get in all sorts of trouble. And this is a, an issue, okay? So they talk about this MPE, maximum permissible exposure. A lot of us live in apartment houses, for example, where we can't have an antenna on the roof. You want to be careful with that, especially if you're putting out 100 watts or so, okay? Um, and you're going you're gonna to love this hobby. You're going to love this. It's going to be great. The problem is you want to keep that antenna as far away from you as you possibly can to minimize um, your exposure to this RF, um, you know, to, to the RF, electromagnetic radiation. So you want to be careful with this. Yes. Is an attic sufficient? Yeah, that's fine. It's more than fine. So my antenna, um, turning around and looking, my antenna is less than six feet away from me. However, I don't transmit at 50 or 100 watts. I'm a QRP guy, right? The most I put out is on a bad day, on two meters, if they can't hear me, 10 watts. And the antenna is outside, hanging from a window. Okay? So... That's far enough for me. It's okay, and I don't do a lot of transmitting. All right. Better yet would be as if it was on the roof. I just haven't gotten up there. So attic is fine. I do have dipoles up in the attic, in my attic, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. Nobody really knows. Okay. They they talk about it a lot. What the effect of RF energy and how can it affects the human body? There really hasn't been any kind of, um, you know, really concise study, but they do um, they do admit that it causes thermal effects, heating to human tissue. So again, be careful with that. Okay, your HT not so big of a problem. The most you're going to put out is five, six, seven um, watts. And then I never hold the thing up to my ear. I have an external microphone. I have it hooked up to my belt in the back. And I talk on the microphone so it's not in my face if I know I'm going to be on there a long time. Remember, you need to be on there for a very long time consistently before it starts to affect you. Okay? Wayne says, time, distance, and shielding. That's exactly correct. Wayne, are you an engineer? That's exactly correct. And Wayne says, RF, uh, RF says, um, 
uh, Wayne says that it involves three things, and he's absolutely correct. The time that you spend transmitting, receiving, no problem, okay? The time you spend transmitting, the distance um, that your antenna is from you, and shielding, whatever shielding you have between yourself and the antenna. And again, uh, not so big of a problem uh, for me. I'm a QRP guy. Lou says QRP is more of a challenge to the operator and can be more fun if that's what you like. Yeah, so not everybody is a QRP person. Uh, I happen to love it, and uh, but it takes a lot more patience. Wayne says, worked in the nuclear industry. All right, good. Well, he knows. Thanks. All right. Um, Winstar Communications Installer. All right, so Wayne, you've worked with the big stuff, so that's great. Um, so you want to be careful with that. Okay, so know what MPE, MPE is, maximum permissible exposure, okay, and they talk about things that you can do um, to uh, prevent that, all right, um, and they talk about power density, it's how much power you're putting out per unit of area, okay, and again, we want to be careful with this. We want you to be aware of this even though you're limited in power as a technician, okay? As you move up the chain, you will add more power. That's why I called it, don't hurt yourself, don't nuke your neighbor's dog, and don't nuke all the dogs in the neighborhood. Because as you move up, you're gonna wanna reach further and further, okay? So they discuss this at length. Please make note of that, okay? So they give you these formulas here uh, that you will never memorize at all. And what they do want you to know is that as the frequency changes, so does the power density, okay? So depending on where you are, be careful. That's all we're saying, all right? Controlled and uncontrolled environments, be careful when you set up your antenna. If it's a populated area, you gotta take that into consideration. If you love to talk in your car, move your antenna. Move your antenna to the center of your car. Doesn't look pretty, but it keeps everybody protected. If you have a 100-watt radio in your car and you're going to be on it for hours and hours, don't take a chance. Move the antenna someplace where it's safe or shield the car. You can do that too, okay? Averaging and duty cycle, ham radio, uh, all ham radios ever made are not designed to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They are not. They will blow up on you, okay? You can't even transmit for extended periods of time because they do generate a lot of heat. And most modern ham radios um, will actually power down, okay? So how much you can transmit is called the duty cycle before the radio starts to squawk, okay? And here they give you a, um, a cool demonstration of how much power you're putting out CW versus single sideband. Again, they're plugging uh, CW, which is true. It's the minimum amount of power needed. And duty cycles, they give them to you here. Uh, I don't need you to know any of this stuff for the exam. Just know that um, when you talk, that uses the most amount of power, sends out the most amount of RF signal, and the duty cycle is the lowest, okay, on single sideband. Okay, and they give you these formulas. Don't worry about them. Just understand that if your antenna is close to you, be careful. Evaluating exposure, they talk about this as well. Um, and it's set by, uh, uh, the limits are set by the OET, which stands for the Office of Elect Engineering Technology. And the Institute for Electronic Engineers also do that as well. And they set the limits, how long you can talk for, and uh, what the recommendation is, all right? All right, cool. And then they go into general procedures, blah, 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 okay? If you have any question, you need to have your station evaluated, okay? And if you don't know how to evaluate it, you get somebody who does, okay? Usually every club has an engineer or two. You can get Wayne. I think Wayne volunteered to do that. He has a lot of experience in it. Um, I'm just kidding, Wayne. Anyway, um, and they go into the safety measures as well, okay? 
again, I'm moving through this, not really heavy duty on the exam, um, but I do want you to at least read the stuff, okay? Mechanical safety, uh, be careful where you put uh, the radio and your antenna, right? Don't have, uh, don't have uh, a six meter antenna, full wave antenna on the back of your car, because that would be 18 feet, right? You make a heavy duty turn at 30 miles an hour, you're killing somebody with that sucker. So be careful with that. Don't operate your radio in heavy traffic, unless you live in New York where it's all bumper to bumper anyway, or Los Angeles, that's even worse. Um, don't make any complicated adjustments to the common set stuff, okay? When you put up your antenna, make sure it's supported carefully. Never go through a tree like this one, okay? Always use a hard hat. You must use a hard hat on field day, for example. We won't let you near an antenna without a hard hat, okay? Absolutely stay away from power lines. There was a father and son team, uh, just got their license in Florida, uh, I guess about four or five years ago. They were putting up an antenna, a dipole. It hit a power line. They're not with us anymore, okay? Be careful, okay? So I told you height is everything in the antenna. The higher, the better. Be careful with the masts. Be careful with the towers you're going to put stuff on, okay? And this is the official apparel that's officially required if you're going to climb a tower. You couldn't get me to climb a tower for a million bucks, okay? But anyway, there are people crazy enough to do it. you got to use these little hook things to make sure you don't fall off, et cetera, et cetera. He looks lovely in that, by the way. All right. They have crank-up towers, towers that actually crank up. There's a crank on the side, and it cranks up to whatever it is, 50 feet, 75 feet, whatever your uh, town allows you to do. Be careful with that, and then they go into, you know, common sense stuff. Use sunblock if you're going to work on a high tower, blah, 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 blah. Uh, never work on something on any tower if it's windy, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And that's it. Any questions? This is it. We're done. Good job, everybody. Have any questions? Did I miss anything? Anything you want to ask me? No, we're all good? Wow, oh, I did a great job, huh? <laughs> okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, next Tuesday, we're going to have a study session. We're going to actually take some exams. Um, well, Gloria went, whew. <laughs> a lot to it, though. Yeah, but you know what? You're going to feel so great about yourself when you pass the exam. Um, you earned it. Um, we're going to just go over some practice exams. I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how to get through it. Go to hamstudy.org. Make sure you take as many exams as possible. Um, and then on next Thursday, uh, I'll start going over some easy general questions. Again, I don't guarantee that you're going to pass, um, but you'll have a little bit more knowledge and hopefully with any kind of luck, uh, you can get through the general as well. If you don't want to do that, I will be giving a general class in a couple of weeks, so you can, um, uh, you can um, take the general. Somebody had a question. Um, the question was, do you know anyone who needed to install aviation lights on their telescoping tower? Yes, I do, Wayne. Uh, so I happen to be a pilot as well, and I fly out of MacArthur Airport, which is out in Suffolk County, and it's kind of a residential area, depending on which runway you land on, and somebody did do that. So the law says that anything above 200 feet, you need to have um, aviation lights. And you know what? Being a pilot, I totally appreciate that and approve that. Okay. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. Any questions, just email me, and um, I'll see you all on Tuesday. Thank all you right. very much, Joe. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Thanks, Joe.